Okay, hey GT, welcome to the show. I'm really happy that you agreed to come on and uh, how have you been keeping? I've been really well, Jacob. Thank you so much for having me on. It's great to see you. Yeah, so I wanted to start by um, talking to you a little bit about spirituality. Something that I've noticed uh, in watching a lot of interviews that you've given is you start by talking about how you had like a juxtaposition growing up between, you know, being, you know, a white Catholic growing up in Beverly Hills, but then also going to like India and like visiting Sri Baba and all of these kinds of like spiritual Eastern things. Um, and I'd love to just get you to talk a little bit more about that and then also talk about how that has reflected itself in your work. Well, I'm glad you're asking because honestly, I never get tired talking about spirituality because I think it in many ways is one of the missing links in people's life and happiness. So, um, you know, I had an interesting upbringing, as you just referenced, um, growing up in Los Angeles, where, I'm, where I still currently live, you know, naturally with Hollywood, there's this big emphasis on how you look, perhaps what you own, um, you know, things of that nature. And then of course, being here in the U United States, I was exposed more to more of a Western way of, of thinking and living, which a lot of times, has to do more with religion and less about spirituality. So because of that, I was baptized Catholic. Um, you know, I went to Catholic school for the for first grade to eighth grade. I was an altar boy. Um, you know, I had my first communion and all that stuff. I at my Catholic school, it wasn't even just like a quasi Catholic school. It was a pretty hardcore <laughs> Catholic school where it was run by nuns and a priest, and we would walk to church every day for forty days during Lent. So it was it was as almost um, orthodox Catholicism as you can get in many ways, um, which by the way, I loved because even though as a young boy, I didn't love the judgmental aspect of religion, specifically Catholicism, I did love the very faith-based way of living. And this very much, you know, you have to live life understanding potential consequences of your life and actions. Um, and also this belief that there's something greater than us Obviously, in Catholicism, it's Jesus Christ and the Holy Trinity and all of that. So that, again, was, was when it's all said and done, was a wonderful experience to go through. But what really enhanced it was then having the complete contrast of what, what at least at the time, not a lot of people I knew in, in my social circle and peer group were going through this as well, which is being exposed to a different side of religion, call it spirituality which in many ways subscribes to almost everything that I just described with Catholicism minus the judgment. Yeah. And so it was a little bit more of a, of an open hearted way of having faith. And it was a lot less based on fear of heaven and hell and things of that nature. And more about kind of saying the choice is yours. Like we all are brought into this world. You know, we're all God's creation, as they say, but it's what we do with this life, which really determines what we experience in this life. And then, of course, it presented the very kind of controversial conversation for Catholicism, at least, which is reincarnation, yeah. which is this conversation of the life that we're living today is likely not your first and likely not your last, which that fundamental difference really is 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 like groundbreaking and really dramatically changes the framing of the conversation. Because as I'm sure you've heard, you constantly hear the saying like, we only live once. And yeah, a lot of times yeah. that, it, that is a teaser to like, you gotta do something crazy because yeah. you only live once. But when you reframe that, that statement and you say, well, you don't live once. Uh, this yeah. lifetime in many ways is being informed by my prior lifetime and my actions. Yeah. And my next lifetime, depending on how I live this current life, may be what may be influenced by that. And, and the last point I will make is what this collision, if you will, of Eastern and Western consciousness really brought me was this conversation of how did I become who I am? Yeah. Right. I mean, I think this is becoming more and more of a conversation right now as we certainly study diversity and equality and equity and all of that is what makes me special? What did I do, if anything, to be born a white male in Beverly Hills with a you know, lawyer for a father and you know, a, a model for a mother and all this stuff? 
why, why am I not impoverished? Why am I not living in another part of the world where there's communism or less freedom? What yeah. did I do? And sometimes people just say, well, that's just dumb luck. That's just the roll of the dice that God does or the creator does or the universe does. Every time somebody's born, it's like to close your eyes and roll the dice. Or is it also influenced by things that I have consciously or unconsciously done in prior lives? So yeah. it really, like when you frame it that way, like it, you just see the world differently. And that yeah. really was the background and backbone of how I was raised, which then, of course, by no mistake, it completely architected and changed the guardrails of, of how I lived my life. Yeah. Because it was because I because I, I knew or at least I was exposed to a lot that informed all my decisions, all my behavior and and how I saw my life and how I saw even the life of the people around me. Yeah. Now, do you ever struggle with spirituality and running a business? Because like a lot of people, you know, the, the saying is that business people have no souls and you know things along that line. Like, how do you have you had troubling internal conversations with that stuff? I've had, I wouldn't call them troubling, but I've had conversations where, like with everything in life, you kind of have to, to understand the circumstances. You kind of have to understand the game because um, what I also was taught with my kind of um, exposure to Eastern ways of thinking is there is a little bit of a sense of humor in yeah. life. Um, and there is a little bit of a game because again, the one last thing that I will say that also spirituality, specifically Hinduism brought to me is, is starting to understand the conversation of that our life is almost a dream within a dream. Yeah. So, so what that means that, again, I'm not trying to contradict myself and say that there are no consequences. So just do it because this isn't real, yeah. but there is a little bit of like that, that yeah, certain circumstances, you, you kind of have to understand the context of things. And it, at, at the end of the day, you still have to, the way I kind of, my, my barometer, if you will, of good versus bad or right versus wrong is, am I harming anybody in a yeah. mean-spirited way? Yeah. So back to your question, when it comes to running a business, yes, we, whether we know it or not, we're wired to, to especially as an entrepreneur such as me, we're wired to grow the business, we're, we're wired to be competitive, we're wired to, um, you know, take no prisoners, so to speak, which yeah. is a very kind of militant, aggressive way, which you could argue is contrary to this peace, love and happiness that I just said. Yeah. But it's, it's understanding how you can exist in that world, but still do it with love, still do it with kindness, still do it with compassion, still do it with empathy. Yeah. And there's times, I'm not going to lie, where I feel like I'm, I'm on the razor's edge of being like spiritual and, and altruistic and heartfelt. And then just being kind of like a, cutthroat businessman yeah and you have to you kind of have to wrestle with it but then again have those cues of saying no i'm being a tough businessman but i'm still being ethical i'm still being yeah. kind and i'm still being sincere and loving yeah yeah no and then just kind of following up about the catholicism stuff i know that like you know you are living your life as a gay man is that some, so yes. are you still able to reconcile your catholic faith or is that something that you're you know working on or what is what are your thoughts on that well uh, i mean I, I had to reconcile my faith early early on because yeah. um you know for better or for worse i was very aware of who i am and my place on this world as far as my sexual orientation and things that i'm drawn to candidly as early as first grade yeah so you know i was a first grader at the Good Shepherd School, which oh, was really? the Catholic school yeah. that I went to for eight years. And I was hearing about, I was reading the Bible, and reading about Sodom and Gomorrah, and I was hearing about hell and damnation. And luckily, again, I think this is why I'm so grateful for my early days, especially the upbringing that I was exposed to, is if I just had that world alone of like, hey, who cares that if this is, if you were born this way, who cares if this is how you genuinely feel? It's wrong. It's like having the desire to steal or yeah. murder somebody, you're going to have to kill that demon. Yeah. Had I had no spiritual, spiritual reference point, I think I might have leaned more in that direction of like, oh God, I need to change myself. Yeah. But again, the, the spirituality let me know 
their north, the North Star of spirituality, and candidly, I think of all religion, if you really strip away some of the kind of business oriented political stuff, <laughs> is just lead your life with love. Yeah. And so the way I applied that to my current circumstance then and now is, hey, I just I just want to love them someone from the same sex. I don't want to hurt them. I yeah. don't want to hurt myself. So even though, yes, the Bible, which was written God knows when, yeah. is telling me about how I to live my life today, I was able to use my own independent thinking to say, yeah, I'm going to set that belief aside because I think nature and spirituality and even other things that I've been exposed to are telling me that that's not right. So that's kind of how I, I yeah. sorted that out at such an early age. Yeah, no, I mean, I was really curious about that stuff because like, you know, I, I'm Catholic, but I'm Indian from, and you know, I'm brown from India. So it's interesting to see the parallels. And I, you know, I, I'm part of a generation that really is not a big fan of how the church views a lot of things like politically. So it's interesting yeah. to talk to you about that. But staying on the note of spirituality, um, I don't know if you've heard of this guy named Ernest Dichter. He was like this big, you know, social market research guy from the 1990s, from the 90, from the 1900s. And basically uh, his idea is that um, products and brands have a soul to them. So when you pick up a bottle of kombucha, it's not like you are just picking up, you know, something to drink. You're picking up something that is a reflection of your identity. Um, so I guess, what would you say, like, how do you feel about that as someone who struggled with his identity? Or for me, maybe didn't struggle necessarily, but had a lot of trouble perhaps being candid with his identity growing up to now be part of other people's identity. Well, I mean, that's a fascinating topic that you're bringing up. And if you don't mind, I'll just go, I want to go just one step prior to the conversation of identity, sure. which what I think you're suggesting is if somebody picks up a bottle of Synergy, yeah. that in many ways is a reflection of their identity. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think, okay. uh, I think so, it, it's a huge thing. Like it's when it, I live yeah. in New York, everyone who picks up like there's a, it's kind of like a meme, the people who drink kombucha, you know, use Peloton stuff like this. It's I feel <laughs> like it's ascribing to be part of a certain way of life. And do you feel like oh, yeah. that's part of it? Absolutely. So the first thing that I just want to say, just to, again, give a little bit more context is I believe products we make are in many ways a reflection of the people behind them. Yeah. So my product in many way is like my offspring. It has my yeah. DNA, it has my personality, it has what I'm turned on to or what I find interesting or what I find beautiful. So I, I think it's just important to, again, for me to answer your question completely and thoroughly is to understand again, the source of the product and also what does, what, what's, how is that starting off with the product itself yeah. in many ways, a reflection of the company or people behind it. Yeah. Um, but now back to your point is then how does that translate to now that identity of the product somehow creating or influencing the identity of the consumer? Yeah. And I think it does because it, it, it I think products we consume and certainly products and brands we support go back to what I believe is, and this is a spiritual statement, every decision, every behavior, every thing that we spend our time on, whether it's watching, consuming, associating with, it defines who we are. Yeah. Whether we know it or not. Yeah. And, you know, that's the interesting conversation, which is, is, is something that we say at GT is a lot that, listen, kombucha and our products aren't a silver bullet to your health. It's not one and done. It's a stepping stone to that next decision. Um, it's part of a, a holistic way of thinking and a holistic, holistic yeah. way of living that, you know, again, because especially here in the US, people think, oh, I drink kombucha. My gut health's great. <laughs> yeah. And it's no, 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 no. It's like, you got to drink kombucha. You have to be plant-based or mostly plant-based you have to drink lots of water you have to exercise you have to meditate you have to you know have a a consciousness that is subscribing to to, to positivity because it yeah. all is so interconnected um so so again back to your point i absolutely think that the products we support and the foods yeah. that we consume in many ways define who we are because the last proverbial you know statement that i'll make is as we all know in many ways you are what you eat yeah 
Yeah. So I guess like kind of, do you think that's like almost the Eastern spirituality? We all are one type thing. Like if you make a product that is connected to like the universal human truth for lack of a better way of phrasing it, it'll do better than yeah. like, like you think that that's how you make a successful product? A hundred percent. I mean, I, I was raised to believe that you could take something as simple as a glass or bottle of water and take two of them, same source, same water. And you could take the bottle or glass and write loving, positive, inspirational, motivational, and kind words on it. Yeah. And then the other one, you can write words that are angry and negative and cynical and pessimistic and mean-spirited. And the energy of those words, even just being written on the container, not even really in contact yeah. with the water, there's beliefs that it changes the water. Like there's been studies huh. that if you do what I just said, and by the way, you layer on language. Yeah. Like I, as silly as it sounds, I walk up to the glass of water that's positive and I say, you're looking beautiful today. You're the best yeah. water ever. And then I go to the negative water and you're like, you're nothing. <laughs> yeah. There's been, as silly as this sounds, there's been studies that if somebody takes a, a, a magnifying glass or a yeah. microscope and looks at the molecular structure now of yeah. one water versus the other, it's reacting. Yeah. Like the, the positive glass of water is, looks like snowflakes and almost is doing some kind of orchestra dance or, or, or formation versus like the water that was called it mistreated. Yeah. It almost looks, almost looks like a like massacre. Yeah. Where it's just like the, the molecules are separate, they're disconnected, they're stagnant, and they're not moving. And one is the representation of life, and the other is a representation of the lack of life. All with, again, just words. For, and for, yeah, for, I mean, for what it's worth, that's why I started liking like your, your product, because I would go to Whole Foods, and it would be like, oh, there's like a nice thing written on the side. There's like a nice message. And I think that that's I mean, that makes a difference for me, like a nice message yes. on the side of a bottle that says like, you yes. know, keep going or whatever. I, I think it's a it, good thing. No, and I agree. And my last point that I'll make before we move on is, you know, I think we have to, to, to understand that, again, there's more that meets, that meets the eye in things. And again, we can never, ever, ever underestimate the power of food. Yeah. Because not only is, again, food is medicine, but in many ways, um, it's, it's one of the most intimate things that we can do is to ingest something that's going to help or hurt us. And that's why we really have to pull out all the stops when ensuring that what we're making is great, whether it's the ingredients, the energy around it, the source where it comes from, the, the, the philosophy of why it exists, yeah. all of those things, not one of those things, all of those things are very, very important. So kind of on that note, um, how do you feel about like naming a GT Synergy? Like, I know you're probably from like the vibe I'm getting from you, you're like at least believing in some of these like ideas that it's like not about yourself or it's about your past lives and your future lives. So was, is it weird for you to like put your like name on a product that's like, you know, that makes you kind of famous? Yes. I think the quick answer is yes. It did feel weird day one, which was in the 90s. Yeah. Um, and I struggled with it for a very, very long time. Um, and I'll tell you why. Is it going back to spirituality and Eastern ways of thinking? Yeah. I was always raised that to believe that the most important thing that you can do in this lifetime to achieve enlightenment, which again is almost like this graduation, is to kill the ego. Yeah. And, and the ego, as you likely know, is it's your pride it's your um it's not necessarily your self-worth it's it, killing your ego is not to say like i then i no longer have to love myself i think that can be easily mis uh, misunderstood it's it's really killing of things that are a, a little bit more narcissistic yeah and so because i was raised that way i my mom actually was the one that told me to put my name on the product because my first label just said kombucha and right before i was about to print it she's like you got to personalize it sweetheart this comes from your heart People need yeah. to know that. Which um, I think makes I like, a difference, you know? Like, oh, it does. Yeah. Absolutely. Especially in this day and age where people want to know, yeah, who am I supporting? Like, is yeah. this Coke behind this brand or is this a bank behind this brand or is it, or is it a person? So or do, you is think it that, do you think that kind of plays into what you were saying where it's like, 
sometimes you just have to play the game, quote unquote. Like, yeah. yes. so you think you just have to do it. Cause I, yes. I feel weird about it with like, cause I, I changed it from like, I changed my podcast from being called keeping cozy. to just being named after myself because I helped, I realized that that helped me with recruiting speakers to come on the show. And I feel weird about like the attention and stuff. And, you know, I, I like, I, I, I don't know if I would say I'm a vain person, but I feel like it kind of creeps up to you when it's like, Oh, like, I have a Google thing now when you search me up or something like that. And yeah. Like that stuff. I feel like I, you know, and just weirded out by, and like, you know, so it's, it's interesting to hear your thoughts. It is. I'll give you one little, you know, scenario that I deal with on a regular basis is that, you know, I pride myself on being very accessible and approachable here at the company. And, you know, we employ quite a bit of people now and in many different departments, but, you know, I like to interact with almost all of them because I, see them as in many ways children family members extensions of what i'm doing but i've i've learned and i honestly don't have a solution for it i've learned that that i can be intimidating only because i'm gt and gt's yeah. on the label right i think it's yeah. perhaps like howard howard schultz who i've met by the way who's a lovely man he's not as intimidating because I don't associate Howard Schultz with Starbucks because yeah. Starbucks feels like it's its own thing. But if it yeah. all of a sudden, if his name was Starbucks and Starbucks was named after him, it would, you would have more of this celebrity vibe, which yeah. is a good thing to a certain degree because you're able to kind of flex that muscle in yeah. your favor if you want. But it can also rear its ugly head and all of a sudden people, you know, don't feel comfortable around you or they don't feel comfortable speaking freely with you or yeah. they just, they just get nervous and they get, and finding they freeze sincere up, so people, it, right. Is that ever yes. a problem? Like, cause I guess when you started, yes. I know, like I watched, I watched a lot of your interviews and stuff and, you know, like I heard you came from like a wealthy background, but not like as wealthy as I guess you are now, but now you're like pretty well known and you're like on Forbes and stuff. So do you think that that's something you struggle with? Like finding sincere people? Yes, yes. I think, as you just put it, is, um, you know, well, first of all, I want to correct you. I was not born wealthy. I was born comfortable, but we were sure. far, far, far from wealthy. Yeah. Um, which, again, is just an important detail because, in many ways, I felt that I was um, emotionally kind of at ground zero when I started my company. So I wouldn't have felt yeah. that if I had a lot of means around me. And in many ways, that was one of the catalysts and driving force behind forces behind making my product and starting my company is I wanted to change my life for the better. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I certainly believe that fame and success, specifically financial success can have more disadvantages than advantages because yeah. to put it simply, you're, you're treated a little bit, um, there's, there's a little bit of um, people think that they know you before they know you. Yeah. And then they draw their own conclusions, which yeah. candidly more, more often than not is wrong. As they yeah. think, oh, because you know, I did this article a couple of years ago <laughs> in Forbes and, yeah. and they labeled me a, a billionaire, Yeah. which honestly, I, as much as I was like, please don't call me that. Like that's not yeah. the, the, what I want to be known by. Yeah. That billionaire is a very um, strong word and it immediately almost automatically brings in a series of predisposed impressions of like, oh, he's this, he's that, he must do this, he must do that. And I can't tell you how many times I've been in those circumstances where people are like, oh, well, you're a billionaire, you, you, know, you must be doing these things. And like, well, actually, yeah, no, I, I still fly commercial. I still yeah. do my own grocery shopping. Like I, I, st I actually make a conscious effort to stay grounded because I've met wealthy and successful people that one of the things that I didn't admire about them is that they were so out of touch with yeah. reality. And that's not yeah. good. That's not good for your soul. That's not good for your business. That's not good for your, for your relationships. I think regardless of how much money you have in the bank, we all need to be grounded. Yeah. I actually, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that Forbes interview. Cause like I, I watched it and it's like kind of crazy. Like they portray you <laughs> as like this. And I bet you that was slightly intentional because it probably got a lot of clicks and I wanted to talk to you about what I thought was a really good move on your part was you met with Cody Co. So for those of you who are watching, uh, this guy, YouTuber named Cody Co, who you probably know, uh, made a video reacting to the interview that GT did. And he kind of roasted you. 
but I think what you did, which was really smart, was you like just said, hey, come hang out and like you squat, like you made that a lot better. And I think that that's like why I would call you more of an entrepreneur than a business person. Because I think that like you take like these negative things and then you like just move forward in a positive way, which I think is the best, you know, if you're going to get memed yeah. out. You might as well like, you know, have fun memed. with it. Yeah. Be in on the joke. Yeah. Well, that's my, th that's my thing. And, and as you pointed out, I actually think that Forbes knew exactly what they were doing. Yeah. Um, it, it's just a shame that I wasn't aware at the time. I was a little bit of their, their puppet. But yeah. um, as you pointed out, I have no regret about it because I learned a lot um, that I'm now applying to my, my future and current circumstances, as well as I, it, it reminded me that, hey, easy come, easy go. You think you're a hero? You think you're going to be on the cover of Forbes magazine? Yeah. Oh, guess what? you're not. <laughs> and in fact, you're going to be the butt of a lot of jokes. And, and yeah. by the way, a lot of mean spirited stuff. I mean, I was actually yeah. very pleased that Cody Co did what he did because he brought in a different kind of yeah. conversation into the picture, a, a little bit more of a roast, a little, a lot more of humor. Yeah. What was happening even before Cody Co, which is why, to be honest, which is why I was so comfortable and, and, and excited to participate with Cody Co is what actually was happening on the Forbes video. Yeah. There was all these horrible comments of, oh my God, who is yeah. this crazy person and name calling all this stuff. And I was like, yeah. oh my God, they just painted a picture of me, but I can't fix it. And people yeah. don't, don't know real from fake. But when Cody Co did it, I was like, great, yeah. this is my opportunity to have fun with it. Yeah. And be, and be in on the joke for the yeah. first one and the second one. Yeah, no, I, I would say that it's views like positive now, you know, like even if you go in the Forbes video and you look at the comments, which, you know, you probably shouldn't like I, I had to learn that the hard way. But like, if you oh, yeah. do look at it, like, um, you know, it's skews positive, like people are like, he's, you know, he's, he's not like the dude who they portrayed there. So like, that's, I mean, that's a cool thing. Like, I think that would, I don't think I would have done that if I was, you know, like, I, I guess it's like, it speaks to not retreating when things get tough you know? Yes. And, like, and yeah. And, and standing for what you believe in. Yeah. I guess kind of just to end it because we've like, you know, covered a lot of interesting topics. There are two more questions I want to ask. And the first is related to just sincerity with the people who like consume your product. Do you think the majority of people when they drink kombucha, do you think that they're doing it for, you know, because they view it the same way you do? Or do you think that they're doing it because it's part of this trend? And I guess it speaks to this overall conversation that we've had about, you know, are you, a, you know, like being a, like, are you playing the, is it the game or is it like, you know, are you converting people to kombucha? Well, you know, it's interesting. Have you, if you had asked me this question five years ago, I would have given you a very different answer, but yeah. What has happened in the space of kombucha and, and honestly, the greater health and wellness space is that almost being healthy has somewhat become a trend. Yeah. Which is blows me away because being healthy is just like having air in your lungs. It's, it's almost a necessity. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but with, you know, because of social media, of course, and because of other things where as you said earlier, what I'm holding in my hand is part of who I am. Yeah. Some people want to project and portray a certain image. And yeah. so they'll use Synergy or another product for that. Yeah. And that's it. They're, they don't have a sincere connection with it. So I can give you an example. What, what is, is framing this point of view is if you asked, and we have asked, um, you take almost a poll of people who drink kombucha and say, you know, basically ask them certain questions like, do you even know how kombucha is made yeah. or where it comes from? You'll get a very underwhelming response. Yeah. And most people will say, probably 90% of people will say, no, I actually don't. And then you follow up with that question, like, well, then why do you drink kombucha? What is it that uh, it contains that makes it healthy? you'll also get a very unclear answer. And yeah. then last but not least, you'll say, and what is the expectation of drinking kombucha? Now that you'll score better because I think kombucha has done a good job of being 
associated with gut health. So I think almost everybody would answer gut health, but that's all they'll say. Yeah. And there's so much more to gut health, number one, and so much more to kombucha than just that. So, so, so is that your responsibility to like educate people on that or, you know? It, it is. It re, I mean, it's, it's, you know, I've said this before in other conversations, I've, I've spent the last two decades plus educating people about kombucha and exposing them to it because they didn't know about it until yeah. I walked into the room or until my product was on the shelf. Now that has changed because of, again, the proliferation of health and wellness beverages, period, and products, but also the proliferation of kombucha products, which yeah. ironically, there's quite a bit of brands out there. And I'm not here to talk poorly about anybody, but I am here to, to answer your question is there's a lot of brands that are saying, hey, we're the kombucha that doesn't taste like kombucha. Yeah. So you, when someone positions himself like that, then it's like, well, then what, well, what am I drinking? Kombucha yeah. doesn't taste like kombucha. Is it even kombucha? So what happens is, is it slowly but surely starts to further this conversation of, oh, it, it's just like, it's better for me. I don't know why. It's better than soda. It's better than juice. But that's all I know. And through that somewhat superficial relationship, you get people that aren't really doing it because they're informed about it and doing it because they know this is like an, a non-negotiable. This is a this fundamental, essential thing that yeah. they need to, to consume on a daily basis. It's again, it's like somebody working out just to look good. Yeah. No, you, you work out to look good. That's a nice kind of side effect, but you yeah. also do it because for your heart, your lungs, your skin, your body, your brain. That's like why yeah. I work out. Yeah. It, I, I a, think it's a side effect yeah. to get fit. Yeah. I fit. guess like both of those examples speak to like you versus society, like an individual doing something for their own benefit and then like versus their appearance in society. Which is tough. I mean, I, I guess we will always, always, we'll always care about what other people think for the most part. Uh, yeah. So, you know, it's funny. I'm, I'm going to give you a quick um, story and you're welcome to cut this out. But I have a really good friend that works at Apple Computer and an Apple Computer is going through a similar dilemma where, you know, they, they created the iPhone and their devices to unlock creativity in people. Yeah. And further this creative consciousness and this creative energy and these creative expressions. But what has happened is some of their devices have been used to be platforms and conduits for things like social media, yeah. which ironically, when you look at Apple's current campaign of privacy, they're actually saying like, hey, no, 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 You're you guys are going in the wrong direction. <laughs> Our yeah. phones are actually potentially, whether you know it or not, being used to steal information from you, steal personal information, and by the way, use that on you to get ads and to yeah. feed you sensationalism and things that get you angry. And so I think, you know, it's a timely comment to say this is that there are many examples, iPhone and other things that they started off with a certain intent, yeah. but through becoming popular and mainstream, they kind of lost their soul and lost their original purpose. And so yeah. through this conversation, you know, kombucha is no exception. I feel like that's the problem with every artist, right? Like every artist has like a love-hate relationship with success. Like, yeah. I, I, like Banksy is all about that, right? Like that's why he had that thing where like the, his painting rip, like shredded after it was sold because like he hated the idea that he was now a part of the culture that he like started out rebelling against. But yeah, it's, it's a hard, it's a tricky path to navigate. I mean, because... did you want to rebel against culture with GT's kombucha? Well, yeah, I mean, and we have. And we're, we continue to, I think it's just, it comes down to how do you do it in this very volatile space that we're in, that you use this yeah. word today, but if you use it again tomorrow, it also means something else. So, you know, we continue to take this message or the stance of food is medicine. And again, yeah. that's not a statement that I've invented. A lot of people use it, but it's a critical statement because it really says something very specific that food is intended to heal. It's yeah. not in intended to just, just taste good or just give you that like sugar high, or by the way, to make you look good when you take a picture with it. Yeah. Priority number one is to, to, to heal and yeah. be medicinal and, and all of that. And so at GTs, like that is who we are. That is why we exist. Yeah. And unfortunately at times that philosophy can be a little unpopular yeah. or not as mainstream where people are going for what's trending and yeah. you know all of that or what's viral. So 
we still want to participate in those conversations because we don't want to be talking to ourselves because then yeah. we're not being successful. But at the same time, we don't want to lose our voice or lose our philosophy in exchange for getting likes. And- well, to end on a new, new perspectives and new ideas, do you think uh, GT's Synergy will ever accept Bitcoin or Dogecoin? Yes. And there's a reason for that. It's not just, again, my personal philosophy on crypto in general. It really is greater than that. I think every human being, every form of life, and that includes brands and companies, you have to be willing to evolve. Yeah. And you have to be willing to work outside of your comfort zone because that's where growth, that's where, that's where um, knowledge and experience and lessons come from. So even if something is somewhat transactional or literally transactional as accepting crypto is, is, is aligned with our philosophy is we always want to continue to evolve and accepting a different form of currency is, is certainly uh, no exception. Dope, man. Well, thank you for coming on the show. No, thank you. It was lovely talking with you. I'm so glad we had this conversation because, you know, honestly, it's not one that I get to have very often about spirituality and kind of other type of higher consciousness uh, topics. So again, thank you 